Welcome back and uh, welcome to the Symposium 2 of the SLMA Foundation Sessions 2020, Neurology, True Companion of Your Health. Uh, this session will be chaired by myself and uh, my co-chair person is Dr. Padmaguna Ratna, Consultant Neurologist and the President Elect of Sri Lanka Medical Association. And we have lined up three experts on neurology on three very important and interesting topics. To start with, I'd like to invite Dr. Gamini Patirana, consultant neurologist from the National Hospital of Sri Lanka to talk about approach to acute headache in adults. Over to you, Dr. Gamini. So introduction, uh, good morning to all of you. Um, uh, now to start the topic, uh, this picture that you are seeing here actually depicts two things. One is a patient with a headache and also a doctor who has finished taking history from a patient with headache, probably. Uh, well, let's go to the uh, acute headache. What are the things that we should know? Uh, this is a common symptom. Patients do present to emergency and sometimes they present to outpatient department. In fact, in the emergency visits, up to 2 to 4% are due to uh, headaches. And out of these headaches, we know majority are benign and minority will be having a serious cause, maybe up to about 19%. And the main task in the emergency actually is to uh, distinguish this minority serious group from the majority benign group. And the tools that we have for anything else like uh, history, examination, plus some investigations like neuroimaging, lumbar puncture, maybe ultrasound and couple of blood tests and so on. Uh, before we move on, these two terms I may be using in my presentation. To those of who you have not heard these two terms, the primary and secondary headaches. Uh, when you say secondary headaches, usually there is a demonstrable pathology or etiology is there. Either a CT scan or a blood test or some uh, lumbar puncture results may show some etiology. And primary headache is where usually you don't have demonstrable uh, pathologies like migraine, tension headaches, cluster headaches, usually they are recurrent and going on for a number of years probably. Now this is a uh, data set from a, a cross-section of a patients who have come to emergency for headache and at the end of the evaluation the diagnosis that they had. Um, you can see that uh, 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 most of them are primary headaches, 54%, and uh, there's a significant group of secondary headaches also here. And you can see secondary headaches also has certain benign pathologies under that, plus serious pathologies as well. So uh, the, the cross-section of the patients who are coming to emergency can vary from various hospitals, but here it's about 50%, 54% and 42%, but certain instances we have seen about 80% of primary headaches, 80 to 90% and the rest being secondary headaches. So this uh, primary headaches and the secondary uh, benign secondary headaches, usually we, after evaluation, we get them to the OPD, outpatient department or the clinic. And serious pathologies needs attention for further workup and uh, necessary action. And in the emergency setting, a patient with headache, uh, they are with pain, so you must relieve the pain as well. And on the other hand, you must work up for a, looking for a cause. Now, it's very difficult to assess a patient who is in pain. So maybe relieving pain should happen concurrently while you are working up the patient. And uh, there, are, there may be certain myths among ourselves, misconceptions, that severe headache indicates serious underlying etiology always. But it may not be always. Of course, when you have severe headache, uh, like thundercap headache, very severe headache, sometimes you might have to look for a cause. But it doesn't mean that all severe headaches or thunderclap headaches will end up having a serious etiology. And gradual onset headache must have a benign etiology, may not be true always. Sometimes gradual onset headaches can have a serious pathology also. And when the headache is uh, responsive to your treatment, you feel a little reassuring that thinking that maybe the etiology is not serious, that also may not be true. You can have good response to your treatment. Your patient may become headache free, but still you can have a serious underlying pathology. Now, 
this is the trajectory of the headaches that they come with on the left hand side you see a sharp rise in the severity of the headache within a couple of seconds or minutes where it's acute severe headache when you call it thunderclap headache when this uh, onset to peak uh, arrives within a minute if it takes longer than a minute you call it acute severe headache and then on the other hand in the middle you see recent onset persistent progressive headache and on the right hand side you see patients come with acute headache but you ask from the patient the patient had previous episodic headache maybe at the background there was migraine tension headache or, or a cluster headache and then currently the patient is presenting with acute headache now this group the third group uh, the ed doctor has to decide whether this this headache is different or similar to the previous headache if it is similar probably you might manage as the same ongoing headache episode or if you think it's a different headache or uh, maybe a thunderclap headache or acute severe headache you may wonder whether there's something else is going on so you might work towards one of the two uh, trajectories that you have shown in the left hand side so this third group actually you can have two etiologies so you have to decide which one the patient is going to be worked with so usually the first two groups will end up having come into the emergency setting in our setting of course they get admitted to hospitals and uh, other group of course may see in the outpatient setting or may come to the uh, emergency as well if you look at the causes of these three groups the acute severe headache or thunderclap headache uh, we, of course you need to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage and then uh, this second one is actually reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome which is a fairly new entity not exactly new but uh, that's a benign cause of acute thunderclap headache and pituitary apoplexy intracerebral hemorrhage dissection of the carotids uh, though the dissection of the carotid takes place in the carotids sometimes they can come with headache meningitis and colloid cyst of the third ventricle maybe carbon monoxide poisoning the patient come from an area where there was fire or um, a, a, a engine had been started in a closed space or something like that uh, workmates group of people coming with headaches uh, and the middle group you have giant cell arthritis venous sinus thrombosis idiopathic intracranial hypertension spontaneous seizure of hypotension uh, meningitis brain abscess brain tumor and subdural hematoma and so on and on the other hand you have the primary headache syndromes so how do you work them up so when a patient comes with headache you need to look for clues in the history and examination which i will show you in a short while and uh, certain clues like say for example there was a neck jerk or uh, after a chiropractor or or maybe a, a pregnant lady so what the circumstances and clues may indicate or give a hint towards a particular diagnosis in which case when the clue is present you work up them in the appropriate diagnostic pathway and if no clue is available patient come with severe headache or uh, significant headache the snoop test snoop, snoop 10 i will show up in the next slide is actually the red flags of headaches where you need to work up now snoop 10 i have put up here even though patient in his history does not tell any clues towards a particular diagnosis you are supposed to ask and look for this snoop 10 snoop 10 i have got from the up to date if you search on the internet you will give the abbreviation or the mnemonic snoop 10 stands for a uh, list of uh, red flags where you are supposed to work them up rather than discharging so if that is there then appropriate testing with either imaging or lumbar puncture and so on so that's in a nutshell how the patients will be worked up what are the clues in the history it's very important to find out what were the circumstances at the onset of the headache if that happens after uh, lumbar puncture yes, lumbar punctures are done for diagnostic purposes and anesthesia for cesarean section and or maybe for uh, surgeries and post trauma together with fever sometimes systemic fevers can give rise to headache and postpartum and peripartum you might think of uh, venous sinus thrombosis uh, following chiropractic treatment or neck jerks you may think of carotid dissection so if you have this history you have a clue towards a particular diagnosis and associated clinical features like uh, headache is associated with low, uh, dropped level of consciousness uh, seizures focal deficit all these indicate a, towards a particular diagnosis so you will accordingly work up the patient and past medical problems also will be useful if the new onset headache comes 
with a history of a background cancer or maybe background HIV will be useful for us in getting a clue towards the diagnosis. An examination also you must look for clues. Ocular examination is very important. You will have a lot of clues in the ocular examinations like Horner syndrome might indicate dissection of the internal carotid. Uh, you are aware that the sympathetic to the pupil goes around the carotid artery. And complete third nerve palsy might suggest it's an aneurysm of the posterior communicating artery. And visual field defects, especially bitemporal hemianopia, might indicate pituitary apoplexy. And disc edema or papilledema might suggest um, space occupying lesion, intracranial hypertension, so on. And cerebellar signs has to be looked for. And you might not pick it up unless you examine the patient might suggest cerebellar hemorrhage and also you must palpate the temporal arteries especially in a patient who is older than 50 years may include it, it may give, be a clue for giant cell arthritis and of course neck rigidity neck stiffness uh, in fact it should be neck stiffness rigidity is different it's again a feature of meningitis or meningismus from a subarachnoid hemorrhage and rashes uh, you all have seen meningococcal septicemia has to be suspected and antibiotics should be immediately started. So you go through the uh, workup and that's the SNOOP 10 danger signs or red flags. Even if the patient does not have a clue in the history of examination, you must actively ask these things and look for these things. Again, some of them are repetition of the same things, but you must look for them. If any of them are there, of course, you need to work up them for uh, 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 for, a, for a course. And next tool that we have is brain imaging. Either you will do a CT scan or a MRI scan. And non-contrast CT is quite useful in acute situation. Uh, they say uh, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, if you suspect and the patient presents within six hours of onset of the headache, there's about 99% chance of picking up on the CT scan, provided you have a hematocrit of more than 30, and uh, the CT scan was read by a radiologist looking for subarachnoid blood. And of course, intracerebral hemorrhage, pituitary apoplexy, and all these things will be picked up on a CT scan. I will show you a couple of CT scans as I go along. Now, you can see on the left hand side, you have subarachnoid blood uh, in the subarachnoid spaces that's whitish in the sulci. And on the middle, you see intracerebral hemorrhage. And on the right side, you see transverse sinus thrombosis. So these are all in non-contrast CT scan. Let's have a look at another one. On the left side, I'm not sure whether you can recognize that there's a midline shift here. And also there is a subdural collection, which is isodense to the brain parenchyma. So that's isodense SDH. And also uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysm with a subarachnoid bleeding on the right hand side. You can see the interhemispheric fissure there is blood and also the aneurysm is shown up in the in the down arrow this was actually uh, passed as a normal ct and picked up by the radiologist so it's very important that when you are having a patient with headache if you do a non-contrast ct and the ct looks normal of course you must get it read by a radiologist because on the console sometimes they can easily differentiate uh, whether blood is there and uh, we, they can do windowing and they can adjust uh, the Im images and look better. Uh, it's, it's not correct if you look at the CT and you think the CT is normal and pass it uh, that the normal CT and later the radiology report says it's abnormal. So the radiology report says subarachnoid hemorrhage, then there'll be a problem. So always, if you suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage, the patient with acute headache, better to get a, a CT scan seen by the radiologist, even though it looks normal. And the other thing, uh, even if the CT scan is normal by the radiologist, it doesn't rule out serious etiologies. That's another misconception people have. Normal CT rules out most of the serious causes. And lumbar puncture is the other tool that we have. Uh, it should be performed in all unusual or persistent headaches, whether the onset was sudden or progressive. And we are trying to pick up meningitis and hypertensions and hypotensions within the CSF space. And uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage is uh, missed in CT scan in about 5% if you do it within 24 hours. And uh, so that 5% will be picked up by the CSF. We are looking for red blood cells and xanthochromia. And xanthochromia is pathognomonic of 
subarachnoid bleeding. Uh, lumbar puncture performed usually after the non-contrast CT brain because, uh, because of the concern that the, there may be a tumor or increased intracranial pressure. The moment you do the lumbar puncture, the patient may cone. So because of that, there's this concern that you must have an NCCT brain before going for the lumbar puncture. But it may not be so if when you're suspecting meningitis in a patient who is conscious, normal conscious level, and fundoscopy does not show any papilledema or there is no focal deficit and we don't wait for non-contrast CT, you can go for lumbar puncture. But otherwise, if you have, if you suspect uh, raised intracranial pressure, of course, you should go for an image before going for the lumbar puncture. And uh, usually CSF is taken for four tubes and you will be looking for RBC counts and the xanthochromia. Xanthochromia means bilirubin in the CSF. And traumatic tap is the next question when you are doing a lumbar puncture, you are looking for blood and seen about 30% but this percentage can change depending on the you know, environment and the person who is doing it. So uh, there were two parameters that we looked for. Um, whether we should look for uh, the RBC count in the first and the fourth, the comparison of the two, four tubes or whether we should look for the absolute count in the fourth tube and this particular article says absolute count in the fourth tube is superior in picking up whether this is a traumatic tap or whether it's subarachnoid hemorrhage. So they say if the red cell, red cell count in the fourth tube is more than 2000, it suggests uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. If it's less it, uh, with no xanthochromia, uh, SH ruled out. And other investigations, you may go for carotid ultrasound looking for dissection and um, Transcranial Doppler also had been described in, in, in things like uh, uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. And the next tool that we have, of course, is MRI brain. And people used to ask for MRI brain headache protocol. Uh, but headache protocol should include all these uh, sequences. But uh, if you just ask headache protocol in our setting, Sri Lankan setting, they may not do all of them. And if you do all of them, it will be a big cost. Patient will be in the machine for a longer period. But depending on what you suspect, you need to specifically ask for various sequences. Otherwise, just writing headache protocol, they may not be doing all of them. Now, for example, if you do not do the fat saturation, axial, cervical and cerebral sequences, you are not going to pick up the arterial dissection. So, so you need to specifically ask for various sequences. And uh, digital subtraction angiography, if the per patient has persistent headache with subarachnoid hemorrhage, you are still suspecting an aneurysm. That's the gold standard. You might have to go for that if you are strongly suspecting, irrespective of uh, uh, other negative results. Depending on the time, I will line up a couple of cases. Uh, the uh, chairpersons will let me know if, if I'm running out of time. The first case is a 45-year-old woman with a history of migraine at the background and a recent diagnosis of hyper hypertension presented with a two-day history of increasing headache. She had taken over-the-counter medications with some relief. On the second day, the patient awoke with terrible pain located in the occiput and radiating to the forehead, associated with photophobia, nausea, and vomiting. The headache was unlike uh, any she had ever experienced. Physical examination revealed dehydration, dehydrated, distressed woman with a blood pressure of 180 by 120, pulse of 110, and temperature 36.1 with no neurological deficit. Now, uh, now the key words here actually is the patient was awakened in the morning with the headache, which was very severe and felt at the occiput and she had never experienced such a severe headache. She had a headache a little few days ago and uh, the blood pressure is high. Now, high blood pressure rarely can be the cause of the headache, but uh, if you think the patient is in having malignant hypertension, but otherwise high blood pressure may not be the cause of the headache. It's just the effect of the pain. Sometimes blood pressure can go up when the patient is having pain. And we did a CT scan. The diagnosis is obvious. Subarachnoid hemorrhage. You can see subarachnoid blood in the sylvian fissure, into hemispheric fissure, and so on. Now, uh, now within six hours from the onset, I said 99% positive rate. If you non-contrast CT. Uh, where the hematocrit is more than 30 and the CT scan is a, a later generation good CT scanner and where the radiologist looking at the CT scan uh, with the intention of looking for subarachnoid blood, the, the picking up rate is 99%. But up to 25%, it dropped to 95%. Uh, but sometimes the CT scan which looks normal to you and me 
radiologist might report later that the patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now this is a case, uh, this is a two CT scan shows uh, convex cell subarachnoid hemorrhage. You see this subarachnoid blood in the uh, uh, sulci, uh, few sulci, very subtle. And when the blood is uh, next to the bone, bone also is white. And sometimes very difficult for us uh, clinicians to look at the printed image and say uh, there is uh, uh, subarachnoid blood or not. So that it's always better to get the radiologist to report on the CT. So this is convex cell subarachnoid hemorrhage which can happen from, not usually from aneurysms, but they are usually by posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome or reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, amyloid angiopathy and so on. So always better to get this non-contrast CT reported by the radiologist when you suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage is what we are talking about, not the traumatic ones where head injury causes subarachnoid hemorrhage. So classically it's occipital headache and atypical presentations can occur so you need to be aware uh, just because you don't have occipital headache, thunderclap headache, acute severe headache, may not rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you have to be very careful in picking up the atypical ones because this is a killer and this happens with young people. So you have a lower threshold in picking up subarachnoid hemorrhage, especially if the patient has uh, neck pain, seizures, meningismus. And look at the fundus if you see subhyoid hemorrhage. Not everyone with subarachnoid hemorrhage will have subhyoid hemorrhage, but if you have it, that favors towards subarachnoid hemorrhage. And 50% of them have normal neurological examination as well. And rupture aneurysm is accounting for about 80, 85%. And if you treat them, the case fatality drops to 18%. If you do not treat, the case fatality is about 60%. And also there may be other causes other than aneurysms also. Now that's also another uh, common uh, presentation of subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is called perimesencephalic hemorrhage, which is a benign condition actually. About 90% of them will not have a surgical cause, uh, but the cause is actually unknown. But the small percentage can have a, uh, aneurysm, so we need to do angiogram in if you suspect an aneurysm here. And there can be other causes also, other than aneurysmal uh, uh, causes for um, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage. Uh, let's have another I'm just lining up a couple of cases to, uh, you know, uh, discuss the various causes that presents to ED. So here's a 50-year-old woman, previously healthy, presenting with four episodes of thunderclap headaches. Of course, when you hear it, you always think this is subarachnoid hemorrhage. She described a sudden onset occipital severe headache. The headaches were associated with vomiting. She reported worsening of headache by straining and lifting objects. Pain lasted for up to about two hours on each occasion. She had a couple of times. The episodes were several days apart. She found no relief from paracetamol. She denied any confusion, fever, visual symptoms or seizures. Uh, her neurology was normal, GCS and temperature is normal. Blood pressure is um, 160-90 and uh, uh, rest of it is normal. And uh, her CSF including the opening pressure also is normal and an uh, urgent non-contrast CT brain also is normal. You might wonder what this problem is. The key words here actually, she had four episodes of thunderclap headache, few days apart, not just one. If you see few uh, episodes of thunderclap headache, you must suspect uh, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. And this patient did not have subarachnoid blood in the CSF and CT scan also did not show any subarachnoid blood, but because Subarachnoid hemorrhage is a possibility in this patient. We went ahead with MRA, uh, magnetic resonance angiogram. And what you see is uh, spasms of the arteries. You see this uh, uh, multifocal segmental spasm. This is called uh, uh, sausage in string uh, appearance. Uh, so reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is likely when you see this. But you have a differential diagnosis of Cerebral angiitis also when you see this. So to differentiate is very difficult, but the clinical picture is more in favor of RCVS. And when you have a question of differentiating angiitis and RCVS, you have a clinical tool, clinical instrument, uh, looking for uh, whether it's RCVS or not. And the clinical instrument also is called RCVS too. So we have two differential diagnoses, and that's the clinical tool that we have. Uh, RCVS2 
And if the score in this tool is more than five, uh, it's likely to be reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So our patient actually had a recurrent single uh, thunderclap headache. So he had five marks there. And you see the carotid uh, intracranial narrowing is there. So two marks there, already seven. And uh, she's a female, so eight marks. So this patient's likely to have a RCVS. So we did not work up towards uh, NGITs, but we did a follow-up MRA and we demonstrated that that was re re reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. So reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome is a benign condition. Rarely it can cause strokes and various disability, extremely rarely can cause death as well. Um, reversible segmental narrowing of the cerebral arteries and they're usually present with thunderclap headache with probably neurological deficits related to brain edema or stroke. Um, sometimes they can cause convexial subarachnoid hemorrhage as well. And digital substitution angiography is the gold standard for diagnosis the condition. And these are again a couple of pictures showing the changes that happen in reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Uh, you can see on the top left, sausage on string appearance, the arteriogram showing spasms. And the middle top, you see the subarachnoid hemorrhage in the convexial subarachnoid hemorrhage and flare dot sign on the right hand side top. The dots are actually spasmodic arteries. And on the bottom, you see the infarcts and the hemorrhages. All this can happen rarely with reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome. Do you have time for another thing? Three minutes? Okay. Let's uh, finish with this case. So here's a 58 year old woman was referred to neurology second day after the coronary artery bypass surgery with headache, with blurry vision in both eyes. In the past, she had hypertension, coronary artery disease, dyslipidemia, and never had ocular symptoms in the past. The usual medications were amlodipine, atovastatin, and aspirin. She's a non-smoker and a teetotaler. She underwent CABG yesterday, as uh, shown before, and noted to has had a period of hypotension during the surgery. She was hemodynamically stable post-operatively. While in the ward, she complained sudden onset headache and blurry vision, nausea, and was treated with IV medications. Her blood pressure is normal, heart rate is normal, visual acuity is little uh, low, but pupil was equally reacting and uh, mild uh, 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 RAPD and ocular motility is normal. So here is a patient post CABG, bypass graft surgery, second day coming with severe acute headache and some visual changes. So uh, these are the key words in this presentation. We did the visual field on this patient and found that there was bitemporal hemianopia. So bitemporal hemianopia usually indicates that there's a lesion in the optic chiasm. And uh, we did the CT scan. That was a non-contrast CT. You can see the pituitary area. There's some hyperdensity spot in the middle. And we went ahead with the MRI and shown that the diagnosis was pituitary apoplexy. So the patient has had a pituitary adenoma before undergoing the bypass surgery. And there was hypotension probably leading to uh, necrosis, infarction or hemorrhage. This is what usually happens. And there's expansion taking place in the pituitary area. And if the expansion takes place upwards, it presses on the optic chiasm, giving rise to bitemporal hemianopia. The expansion takes place sideways. It can press on the, uh, the structures in the cavernous sinus, usually the third nerve, giving rise to diplopia. And expansion downwards can cause CSF, uh, rhinorrhea, and so on. So these are the usual things that can happen with pituitary apoplexy. Um, I think we are. So uh, this is a fourth case. Um, he's a 19-year-old previously healthy male admitted with headache with fever and uh, no visual disturbances, no vomiting. Examination did not reveal any abnormality. Visual fields were normal. Hematology, biochemistry, x-ray of the skull normal. He was given treatment and was discharged. So he, his headache got better, patient was discharged. We have this uh, preconception when the headache is better, probably it's a, maybe a benign condition. Four days later, he was readmitted with throbbing headache located over the both temporal regions, no nausea, vomiting or visual disturbances, behavioral disturbances, seizures, and his Glasgow coma scale was 15. Nervous system examination normal, including ocular exam. He keeps complaining of throbbing headache with episodic worsening in severity. So we have some clues. The patient had come with a second episode of headache here. 
and uh, we don't have much uh, examination findings to uh, giving rise to any clues but we feel that there's something serious going on we went ahead with the ct scan that's what we saw anyone can recognize uh, this is actually a colloid cyst of the third ventricle you know the lateral ventricles joins the third ventricle at the foramen of munro that's where the the cyst takes place and it's in the anterior wall so it has a siphon effect at times it blocks the csf pathway causing headache especially if you lean forwards it tends to block the pathway so the headache can comes on when you lean forward and you know uh, settles when you uh, lean backwards so colloids is the third ventricle uh, is what the diagnosis is. So these are cystic lesions located in the anterior part of the third ventricle close to the foramen of Munro. Uh, patients may remain asymptomatic sometimes for the for life certain patients and others paroxysmal headache, gait disturbances, nausea, vomiting, behavioral changes and sometimes weakness of the lower limbs, impaired memory, a new learning disability and somewhat, sometimes you can have sudden deaths from this and these diagnosis was established in the postmortem. So non contrast of the brain uh, you see a well-defined round oval non-enhancing lesion. These are colloids, so it looks brighter on the non-contrast CT. Treatment, uh, you have surgical treatment, you know, either endoscopic resection or microscopic removal by the transcortical, transcalosal endoscopic method. So, so these are the uh, cases that I... Uh, so we will stop here and uh, any questions I can answer. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Damani Patiran. I think that we will move on to the second uh, presentation. Uh, the second would be again uh, from the uh, from a neurologist who would be addressing more on the from the peripheral nervous system. He would be talking to us on practical approach evaluating symptoms of peripheral nervous system. The presentation will be done by Dr. Champika Gunawardena, consultant neurologist, teaching hospital Ratnapur. Over to you, Champika. First of all, I would like to thank Sri Lanka Medical Association for giving this opportunity to make this presentation in uh, Foundation Sessions 2020. And I would like to appreciate the efforts they have been taking right throughout to promote academic activities during this COVID crisis. So I would like to take you through a journey of peripheral nerve disorders during the next 20 to 30 minutes. And I think this journey is going to be a little tough and exhausting, but I hope at the end you will enjoy it. So first of all, we'll have an overview of peripheral nervous system. So peripheral nervous system is all the parts of the nervous system outside the brain and the spinal cord, which includes the cranial nerves and the spinal nerves from their origin to their end. One special point about anterior horn cells which is technically a part of the central nervous system, which lies in the uh, spinal cord. But most of the clinicians would like to discuss it under peripheral nerve system for practical purposes, because it is one of the key component of the motor unit. Peripheral nervous system includes motor nervous system, sensory nervous system, and autonomic nervous system. So, just to recapitulate what we have learned at medical schools, we'll look at the anatomy of the peripheral nervous system. If you look at this diagram, you will see the spinal cord and the roots coming out from the nerve, uh, spinal cord with the anterior horn cells, anterior horn cells and the spinal nerve roots. Then some of these nerve roots get together to form plexus, like cervical plexus, brachial plexus, uh, lumbar plexus and sacral plexus. From these flexors, some of the components get together to form individual specific nerves like ulna, median, radial, uh, sciatic, various type of specific nerves. Those nerves, uh, travels in, uh, those nerves travel in the body towards one action, uh, activate muscles, muscle groups. So at this entry points, they, are, they form uh, neuromuscular junctions and then they activate specific muscle groups. In this lecture, due to the time limits, I would like to limit my talk for anterior horn cells, nerve root, plexus and specific nerves. The neuromuscular junction and muscles are 
going to be a separate lecture. So I will confine my lecture into these four categories of peripheral nervous system. If you look at the features of peripheral nervous system disorders, if it is motor neuron dysfunction, you will see muscle wasting, weakness or paralysis, and absent or diminished reflexes. In sensory neuron dysfunction, there can be abnormal sensation like pain, numbness, tingling, and burning, etc., or loss sensation. Autonomic nervous dysfunction, again, it's going to be autonomic dysfunction, various like uh, postural hypotension, gastroparesis, and various sort of autonomic nervous dysfunctions. Some of these disorders are going to be progressive, disabling, and sometimes they can be fatal. So it is important to identify them accurately and categorize them accurately. So we'll move on to clinical evaluation. Like any other condition, the fundamental clinical evaluation is history and examination. In history, what we are going to look at, we try to identify the deficits by analyzing symptoms, especially the on onset and the progression of the disease and location of the involvement and further information about the potential causes might give in the history a clue about the etiology, like family history, toxic exposure, and various past medical disorders, etc. When we move on to examination, since we are mainly focusing uh, general practice and OPD setup in this lecture series, the examination has to be always focused examination due to limited time period we get during our uh, patient examination during OPD confrontation. So in focused examination, our main aim is to define the type of deficit, whether it's a motor deficit, sensory deficit, or it's a combi combination of both. To assess the sensation, what we usually do is pinprick and temperature for small fibers, vibration and proprioception sensory assessment for large fibers. Motor strength, you all know how to do the motor uh, strength assessment during your neurology examination. But one important thing is to uh, note whether the motor weakness is proportional to the degree of atrophy or the wasting. If it is disproportionate, like without wasting, a significant weakness without wasting, one thing you have to suspect is whether it is upper motor pathology, either brain or spinal cord problem, or else if it is a peripheral disorder, it has to be a acute onset one. The other important thing is deep tendon reflexes. The distribution of reflex abnormalities, you have to look. Not only the focused or the affected area, rest of the deep tendon reflexes you have to do and try to correlate with the clinical findings. Autonomic dysfunctions uh, we usually do not assess unless it's a specific neurological examination in a in a specialized unit. So in clinical evaluation, these are the key points which we find in peripheral neural, uh, nervous system disorders, fasciculation, muscle wasting, reduced tone, reduced motor power, reduced or diminished reflexes, loss sensation, which can be localized, dermatomal or patchy, or stocking and glove type distribution. So these key features is there, then it is peripheral nervous system disorder or lower motor type pathology you are dealing with. Now with this clinical assessment, we should be able to find a simplified clinical approach to categorize our uh, clinical problems when we see a patient with peripheral nervous system disorder. So how are we going to make that? We need answers for the anatomical level of lesion, whether this problem is at anterior horn cell level, this is, uh, level, spinal root level, flexus level, specific nerve level, or neuromuscular junction level. Then we should get an answer for the type of lesion, whether disorder is due to nerve cell injury or damage, or it's due to myelin sheath problem, or the axonal problem. Then we have to get some idea about the etiology of the lesion, it's probably come through the general examination or by the history, whether it's a genetic or 
hereditary problem, infection, inflammation, neoplastic or paraneoplastic problem, or toxic or metabolic condition give rise to peripheral nerve disorder. So if we can find answers for these things, we can make a clinical, simplified clinical approach. Now if I sum summarize the uh, key points, the chronicity, whether it is acute onset problem, subacute onset problem or chronic problem, the laterality, whether you are dealing with a unilateral disease or bilateral disease. If it is bilateral disease, then it is symmetric or asymmetric. Then the site of the disorder, whether it's a distal problem, proximal problem or localized problem. Then again, the deficits, whether it's sensory deficits, motor deficits or combination of both. If it is a sensory problem, whether it's dermatomal, patchy or glove and stocking type problem. If it is motor problem, you are dealing with a myotomal problem, then it is single myotome or multiple myotomes or else a diffuse problem. When you put all these things into simplified chart, you will see you can differentiate anterior horn cell problem, root problem, plexus or specific nerve problems depending on the positive or negativity of previously mentioned clinical features. So we can formulate a simplified clinical tool in this chart. So now I move on to a few cases. They are very simple and straightforward, specifically designed for general practitioners and OPD setup doctors to identify them in a simplified manner and then to refer to specialized uh, units or departments. So the case number one is a 24-year-old uh, right-handed, 24-year-old university student presented with progressive weakness and wasting of right hand for about one to two years. He has noted gradual decline of hand grip power and wasting of hand muscles. No significant pain, no numbness. On examination, the right side wasting and mild guttering. I don't know whether you can appreciate it on the photograph. Um, right side finger flexion, extension, abduction, they're all weak, but it's minor weakness, grade four out of five. Uh, the other side, left side, there was subtle muscle wasting and weakness. Other than that, forearm muscles, reflexes, and sensory assessment was normal. So, um, where could be the lesion? We'll try to summarize the clinical features. It's a bilateral asymmetric problem. The weakness and wasting has involved in the distal muscle groups of the hand. And it's motor only. It can be either myotomal or localized, but absent sensory symptoms or signs. If you look at our clinical tool, which you have formulated earlier, the only category without sensory symptoms or sensory uh, signs is anterior horn cell, right? So if you use this simplified uh, tool, we, we, we can categorize it into anterior horn cell pathology. So there are a number of anterior horn cell pathologies like motor neuron disease and various other, but in this particular condition, it is distal spinal muscular atrophy involving the distal muscle groups in young adults. Uh, it's a symmetric type of involvement, mainly in the hands. Uh, the, there are a few other rare conditions like distal acquiring, acquired demyelinating uh, symmetric neuropathy and multifocal motor neuropathy which can give rise to similar picture, but they are very rare specialized conditions which are useful for uh, neurology trainees and registrars. So what are the things which we have to remember in this case? If sensory symptoms and signs are absent, always consider the possibility of anterior horn cell disease. And uh, common conditions in distal hand muscle wasting are ulnar nerve and CAT1, but there can be other conditions, other rare conditions like distal spinal muscular atrophy, like in this case, and motor neuron, uh, multiple, uh, multifocal motor neuropathy. 
We'll move on to the next case. Case number two is a right-handed 54-year-old teacher with a background history of CA breast presented with progressive weakness and wasting of the right shoulder area and arm for about three months duration. She complains severe pain in the neck and right shoulder area which is radiating along the arm. On examination, there was no uh, significant wasting on shoulder girdle area including supra and, uh, supra and infraspinatus muscle groups and deltoid and bicep muscles. And motor examination revealed right shoulder flexion, extension, abduction and adduction, internal and external rotation weakness and reflexes in the bicep reflex was diminished. Further, there was C5, C6 dermatomal sensory impairment as well. Left side of the uh, upper limb examination was normal. So where could be the lesion? Once again, we will try to summarize our clinical findings. It is a unilateral problem involving the proximal muscle groups of shoulder girdle area, weakness and wasting both were there. The motor weakness, if you look at, it is not a single myotome. It's C5 and C6 involvement. Sensory symptoms, again, confined to C5 and C6 dermatomal regions. So if it's a multiple myotome problem, and multiple dermatomal problem, then you have to think either multiple root involvement or flexus involvement. In this area is the brachial flexus area. So most likely diagnosis is brachial flexus injury or due to probably due to radiotherapy or something. So if you are still confused with whether it is C5, C6 root problem or brachial flexus problem, we have to select the best next investigation that is EMG or nerve conduction studies. In any peripheral nerve disorders, if you are in doubt, the most of the time answer will come through the EMG or nerve conduction studies. So what are the things we have to remember in this case? When there is multiple adjoining roots are involved, you have to consider plexus lesion. And the other important thing is mononeuritis multiplex. Now, if you look at this case, if it is mononeuritis multiplex, then it has to be now to infraspinatus, supraspinatus, axillary, and many nerves. But in usually in mononeuritis multiplex, the specific nerve involvement, not in the specific uh, area, one place, one hand, then it has to be like one side ulna nerve, the, uh, the left side ulna, right side radial, uh, lower limb, uh, common peroneal, likewise, different sites get affected in mononeuritis multiplex. So, mononeuritis multiplex is unlikely when there is uh, all the involvement in one particular area. So next case, it's 45 year old minor with the background history of diabetes and hypertension presented with recent onset lower limb weakness for three days, experienced several tripper spells, also complains left lower limb numbness along and long standing back pain. Examination revealed no wasting of fasciculation. Left ankle joint dorsiflexion was weak and aversion of the foot also was weak. Uh, tendon reflexes were normal and rest of the muscle groups were normal. So where can be the lesion? If you summarize the lesions again, the clinical features, it is a unilateral problem, distal, there was weakness but no wasting. Why is that? As I mentioned earlier, if it is an acute onset problem, even if it is lower motor, peripheral nerve disorder problem, the wasting may not be there because it's too early to get develop the wasting and if you look at the motor weakness it is myotomal problem it is localized to one myotome if you look at l5 sensory symptoms it can be dermatomal l5 dermatome region or it can be localized to a single nerve like common peroneal nerve 
So it is little confusing even if you apply it to the clinical tool. It can be root problem or it can be nerve problem, L5 root or common peroneal nerve problem. But if you look at the history again, the aversion was uh, affected and inversion of the foot was not affected. If you, this is one uh, clinical difference between L5 root problem and common peroneal nerve. In common peroneal nerve, foot inversion is not affected, like in uh, contrast to L5 root problem. So that will give you additional uh, bit of neurology to differentiate L5 root from common peroneal nerve. So what are the things you have to remember? Again, when it is single nerve problem, either it's common peroneal nerve like in this case or ulnar nerve or any other case, then you are not supposed to miss leprosy, especially in our country, which is very common and very commonly they uh, go to general practitioners and come to OPDs. So do not miss leprosy. Do, uh, and if you think about it, Look for thick nerves and hypopigmented skin lesions and that is very important to remember. The next case uh, is a 15 year old school girl who was previously healthy, presented with progressive bilateral lower limb weakness, found it difficult to walk and complains numbness in both lower limbs and hands. On examination, there was no wasting of fasciculations. Both lower limb power was grade 3 to 4, predominantly proximal and distal. Upper limb muscle strength was normal. Deep tendon reflexes were markedly diminished in both upper and lower limbs. Sensory assessment was within normal limits. So what could be the diagnosis? Once again, if you summarize the clinical Key clinical features, it's an acute or subacute problem, progressive, bilateral, proximal more than distal, uh, motor involvement, either it's multiple myotomes or diffuse type of motor involvement, sensory symptoms, bit non-specific, could be diffused. So if even if you put that into this clinical tool, the chart, uh, it's combination of many things. If you see that combination of either multiple root or plexus or different nerves, then you have to think about a more complex situation that is polyradiculitis. Acute polyradiculitis, like in this case, that is in other words, guillain barre syndrome. So acute polyradiculitis, now one other important condition which you should not miss at any cost. So do not forget Guillain -Barre, possible guillain -Barre syndrome when you see a patient with acute or subacute onset numbness and weakness. And if you miss GBS, then you are going to lose that patient sometimes. So do not miss areflexia in acute peripheral nerve disorders. If you identify your suspect that need urgent referral or admission, because you can't miss acute polyradiculitis. The case number five, probably the last case. So she's 64 year old housewife with a background history of diabetes, hypertension and hypothyroidism, coming with numbness and tingling of both feet for about one year duration. She's a vegetarian for last four years. On examination, there was no wasting, ulcers or skin changes noted. Both lower limb power was grade 5 out of 5. Deep tendon reflexes were diminished in bilateral ankle. And absent pain and light touch sensation up to mid calf level in both limbs. Joint position sensation was also absent. So by history itself, uh, anybody can suspect or get a clue you are dealing with the what type of problem but if you look at again the clinical key clinical features it's a chronic problem progressive 
bilateral symmetrical problem involved in distal area but without motor weakness reflexes were diminished in ankle region sensory symptoms are in stocking type so in that case we do not need actually this tool we are it's very straightforward you are dealing with a polyneuropathy so this is going to be a sensory only polyneuropathy so we call it sensory polyneuropathy but sometimes you might see motor neuro motor polyneuropathy especially with late toxicity tick paralysis and various other conditions in sensory polyneuropathy diabetes metabolic conditions like renal alcohol various toxins b12 deficiency and other autoimmune and paraneoplastic conditions so things to remember in this type of polyneuropathy case especially every polyneuropathy in diabetic patient is not due to diabetic neuropathy that is one important thing that you have to remember because you are not supposed to miss any other treatable cause like vitamin associated uh, treatable causes like vitamin b12 deficiency paraneoplastic or paraproteinemias which are treatable and you do not attribute all the peripheral neuropathy conditions in diabetic patients are due to diabetic neuropathy you have to investigate further examine carefully and look for any other associated features to suspect a different etiology and other important thing is you should not miss motor impairment in sensory neuropathy sometimes especially diabetic patient can present with typical diabetic type polyneuropathy uh, with subtle proximal muscle weakness uh, which affects their mobility so that is chronic inflammatory type demyelinating polyneuropathy in cidp which is again easily treatable and prevent disability for the patient so i think you have enjoyed the journey and thank you very much thank you very much dr champikonadana for making that sorting out peripheral issues so simple and effortless for the ordinary doctor so we would be moving on to the next presentation and uh, would be trying to answer the questions at the end of the session our next speaker again would be addressing the problems in central nervous system he would be talking to us on dementia syndromes clinical evaluation and management uh, the speaker is dr manjula kaldera consultant neurologist teaching hospital anuradhapur over to you manjula uh, thank you very much ma'am ma uh, hope, hope uh, you all hear me uh, if anyone want to uh, have the slides you can drop me an email um, uh, thank you very much uh, sri lanka medical association uh, president and the president elect you me the opportunity and uh, congratulate you having such a wonderful participation in these difficult times so my talk is uh, dementia syndromes uh, clinical evaluation and, and, and management is a little bit of a sort of a task uh, for the generalist but i'll try to sort of make it more simply for simplify uh, for a general doctor uh, yes uh, so uh, like any uh, syndrome dementia is also a collection of symptoms and signs and the most commonly uh, presenting um, symptom uh, is memory complaints but all the people that we encounter with memory complaints are actually not having uh, not having uh, dementia uh, most of them uh, do actually uh, uh, have uh, uh, do actually have uh, uh, no cognitive complaints uh, so most of them are worried well um, they uh, are having anxiety problems uh, they usually comes and uh, complains to doctor i have forgetfulness but then you elaborate uh, uh, get a good narrative uh, what they uh, refer as uh, their cognitive complaints actually they are having uh, deficits in their attention that they forget something to get from their uh, shopping list uh, kind of thing uh, and people uh, who can have these complaints with uh, uh, depression as well so it's very important to look for the symptoms and signs of uh, depression if they have any uh, then it's worth treating them and sometimes people can have functional or historical uh, complaints of cognitive impairment where when you converse with these patients you obvious that they don't have a cognitive impairment but when you perform a cognitive battery 
you get unrealistic uh, deranged cognitive results which is uh, due to their functional uh, functionality of the problem which is hysterical um, when you encounter cognitive problems sometimes these cognitive problems can be very mild uh, uh, mild decline of their cognitive functions which usually doesn't affect their activities of daily living those conditions are called mild cognitive impairment which usually doesn't help with treatment uh, you usually don't treat them uh, because there's no benefit has been shown treating mild cognitive impairment but when you have uh, cognitive function derangement which affects the activities of daily living that is called dementia now dementia is an umbrella term you can get dementia due to various other conditions uh, neurodegenerative conditions neuroinfections metabolic structural toxic uh, encephalopathies uh, can give rise to memory complaints or memory cognitive deficits but uh, today's our talk uh, will be based on neurodegenerative dementias where you get a uh, deterioration uh, of the uh, uh, or progression of their syndrome without any reversing now neurodegenerative dementias are basically proteinopathies when your proteins functioning normally they have a normal uh, architecture but when these abnormal when these proteins uh, folded in an abnormal fashion or a misfolded protein they become very uh, clumpy sticky and they used to aggregate and these aggregations takes place in the brain cells and which would promote neurodegeneration so we are going to discuss these neurodegenerative conditions uh, in this talk now the abnormal pr proteins uh, are uh, varying uh, uh, according to the dementia syndrome most of you aware about alzheimer's disease which is uh, the abnormal protein is uh, amyloid and tau in frontotemporal dementias uh, uh, significant number of uh, uh, cases associated with tau proteins and the tdp43 and there's uh, about 10% associated with the fast protein and in levy body dementias uh, you'll get uh, synuclein pathology now uh, of course these uh, proteins are helpful uh, when you have challenging case to find uh, the diagnosis uh, uh, verified but uh, they are not available to most of us now it is very much important uh, to solve the puzzle um, so uh, sorting out a dementia syndrome is something like a jigsaw puzzle where you need to uh, uh, where you need to uh, make sure that uh, uh, what is the most likely clinical syndrome so the uh, uh, things like attention uh, 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 the, the, the domains of the cognition uh, are the important things uh, to sort out the syndrome so uh, uh, what are the important domains that uh, you need to concentrate on attention and orientation commonly seen attention problems in the anxiety and anxious people worried people are likely to have attention problems and the orientation problems are commonly seen in people have delirium uh, then the memory uh, is commonly seen in alzheimer's disease the language where your speaking language the reading writing language could be affected in uh, semantic dementias and primary progressive aphasias and then the logopenic variant of the uh, primary progressive aphasia and then the executive and frontal lobe functions are commonly affected in the frontotemporal dementias apraxias are commonly seen in cortical basal syndrome visual spatial ability uh, where you check uh, the the copy drawing uh, uh, the, your visual functions being tested can be affected in uh, conditions like uh, posterior cortical atrophy and the body dementia now we'll go to the case scenarios case 1 uh, a 67 year old uh, retired policeman was brought in by his wife uh, and wife reports that the husband is forgetful um, in your when you're taking a detailed history you will encounter that this man is failed to keep the important appointments uh, and he is extremely poor in taking messages pa and passing them to the family members when the family members are not at home and uh, he is used to ask uh, the, the same questions again and again repeated questioning and uh, he has once lost the route when he is returned from home uh, returned home uh, from the shop and his neighbors have helped them to find the way back to his home um, initially the man uh, the policeman was the one who sort of uh, the leading figure in the home who used to sort of settle the uh, 
the utility bills, arranging home financial things, buying things from the shop. But now the wife has to take over the uh, the leadership in the uh, the household chaos. And um, uh, when you encounter his uh, remote memory, uh, is uh, relatively much preserved than the recent memory. Um, when you ask about the school days, the first job, you would be able to give some good account uh, to the things related to the past memory. When you do a mini mental uh, uh, exam, uh, uh, he scored very poorly uh, in the recall, which is uh, uh, si significant for the episodic memory, and the copy drawing uh, that you can see, uh, the intersecting pentagon was not properly drawn uh, as it is uh, shown in this slide. So what do you think? This patient is likely to have Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's uh, uh, dementia um, uh, is a, uh, typically present uh, in the old age after 65, and the predominant uh, cognitive uh, derangement is seen in the memory domain. So it is being considered as an amnestic syndrome. In that episodic memory, which is the part that we are going to test by the recall, there's a gradient memory impairment has been demonstrated where the anterograde memory, which is a newly encountered memory, is uh, more deficient than the retrograde memory, the past event memory. And these patients are typically having uh, the thing called head turn sign, where you uh, ask a patient uh, about something very relevant, you expect to know the answer, something like, how did you uh, come uh, to the clinic today, something like that. Uh, these people either give a wrong answer or give the correct answer and perhaps turn to the spouse or the informant who is a uh, uh, bystander to get a visual cue that the patient has answered correctly or not. And uh, the repetitive questioning was also a, uh, a, a sign that the patient has anterograde memory problems. Uh, and uh, not only the memory, they have the other domains as well, like executive functions, language, visual spatial impairment, um, usually developed towards the latter part of the disease. They can have uh, common psychiatric problems like depression and anxiety. So it's important to look for these features and, uh, and uh, treat them, uh, the co associated psychiatric problems. Um, and they can, uh, the Alzheimer's disease is a pathology in the medial temporal lobe. So that can confuse with the uh, frontal temporal dementia, but the most importantly, the social and emotional functions are well preserved at the, at the beginning of the disease, which would be a helpful thing to differentiate from the frontal temporal dementia. And in the early phase of the Alzheimer's disease, there, there's no any agitation or psychosis being noted, but in the latter stages, these things can, can, can develop. Now, uh, you all know, like there are two pathognomonic lesions in the Alzheimer's. You all have heard of amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles from your medical school days. Um, and there are important biomarkers which would be helpful uh, to define uh, the syndrome. Uh, uh, in, in the CSF, you can do uh, amyloid beta protein, uh, which usually you expect to uh, lower the amyloid beta proteins and increase tau proteins, the total tau and the phosphorylated tau, which is a marker of neurodegeneration to be increased. So this amyloid beta to uh, phosphorylated tau ratio is something extremely sensitive and sense, uh, specific for Alzheimer's disease. And the other uh, biomarkers are the amyloid beta uh, PET scan and the tau PET scan, again, which are not available to most of us uh, for defining these syndromes. But uh, what we get are the imaging facilities that uh, in this uh, scan, what you can see that uh, the, the medial temporal lobes are atrophied and there's compensatory uh, uh, expansion of the lateral horns, uh, the anterior horns of the lateral ventricles. Uh, in this case, uh, the, in the axial scan, the right uh, lateral horn is more enlarged than the left. And in the coronal images, uh, across these lateral horns, you can see the lateral horns are enlarged, as well as the, uh, the me medial uh, uh, temporal lobes are being atrophic. Uh, that is something uh, that we also can see in our patients. When it comes to the diagnosis, uh, you need to plan the treatment. Uh, you have to have a comprehensive care plan in any dementia condition because it's a challenging situation. There are specific uh, treatment for treatment uh, for Alzheimer's disease and acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh, like donapazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine uh, are useful at any stage of the Alzheimer's disease. Donapazil and rivastigmine uh, are available for us 
Donopacil is available in the oral format. Reverse Sigmin is available uh, either in oral and skin patches. Uh, uh, NMDI agonist memantine uh, is also uh, used as an add-on therapy for Alzheimer's disease, uh, can be uh, used for the moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease uh, therapy. Uh, all you all know that they are not wonderful drugs, but they help to produce the uh, uh, reduce the rate of uh, progression of the disease. In that aspect, they are useful. Um, again, you need to uh, look for the vascular risk factors and the comorbid conditions like psychiatric conditions and anxiety, depression, and treat them. And uh, sometimes certain drugs can be uh, affect uh, badly for the cognition, something like tricyclic antidepressants, the anticholinergic drugs that you need to withdraw. You have to make uh, the home environment friendly uh, to give a good orientation for the patient. Uh, a large uh, clock, wall clock, a big numbered wall calendars uh, and marking the day on the calendar by a cross or something like that would be helpful to give a good orientation uh, to the patient. Uh, it's important uh, to counsel uh, and uh, uh, plan the future for the patient uh, along with the family. Sometimes a patient can have legal uh, things with regard to the property, uh, the bank accounts. So somebody uh, uh, related to the patient uh, uh, should be appointed or advised to be appointed as a power of attorney. And uh, handling of responsibilities if, if the patient is sort of a um, person who is sort of having responsible job, uh, handing off responsibilities appropriately to someone else uh, should be uh, uh, something important to look at when you're diagnosing a patient with Alzheimer's. Again, the care burden is an important thing, especially towards the latter part of the disease. Uh, you need to address uh, the carer's complaints and try to help them uh, in whatever aspect that you can. Okay. Um, we are going to the case number two. A 57-year-old woman presents with uh, visual difficulties. Uh, she has seen uh, by the optometrist and the ophthalmologist uh, in several locations, uh, and her visual activity is six by nine, um, which is not a great uh, loss of vision, uh, and has been tried to correct with uh, glasses, but very little success has been noted with her vision. Her husband reports that she does not see things around her, and particularly onto the left side. Uh, once they were uh, while doing the shopping. Uh, the husband took a lifter and then the patient was start continuing to walk straight ahead. Uh, and then she has uh, she, she lost while during the shopping. Um, and uh, when you do the MMSC, uh, mini mental examination, she has dem demonstrated extremely poor in uh, copy drawing uh, of the intersective pentagon as you see in the image. And, uh, and uh, the other aspects of the memory uh, is not relatively uh, or relatively preserved, including the episodic memory, the recall memory. Um, you do a neurological examination and there's uh, somewhat hemianopia, uh, left homonymous hemianopia uh, is uh, detected in the confrontation uh, of this patient. So this patient presents with significant visual complaints where the eye doctors uh, see uh, nothing wrong with their uh, part of uh, uh, the disease condition. Um, um, so the diagnosis in this patient is the posterior cortical atrophy, where you get atrophy of the brain in the posterior cortex, mainly the occipital uh, and parietal lobes, and uh, to a certain extent in the posterior uh, temporal lobes as well. So these patients present with visuospatial and visual perceptual uh, uh, deficit symptoms. Uh, what do you mean by visual spatial is uh, in your visual world, uh, the spatial arrangement of things like the things uh, located in front, the things located back onto your right and left eye. The perceptual uh, means that uh, the, the, the knowledge of the visual knowledge of the, the object, the color, the shape, the texture, the surface texture, that, that what kind of knowledge into your uh, the visual uh, knowledge. Uh, so they both lose the visual spatial and the perceptual uh, knowledge uh, to a gradient extent. Uh, and because of these visual uh, and the perceptual problems, these patients, if you inquire properly, they can have like minor car accidents, difficulty uh, challenging uh, parking in uh, small slots. Um, and uh, they are extremely anxious about riding the escalators. Uh, they find difficulty judging the speed of the traffic. So they're extremely anxious uh, uh, 
crossing the road or they might have encountered with road traffic accidents they are uh, extremely difficult to sort of find it difficult to enter into a revolving door um, and of course they they may complain uh, that challenges in reading they may describe that the words are jumping here and there because uh, there are visual spatial uh, problems are there uh, troubling them with the reading uh, they also have abnormalities with the color vision they may describe that the objects are diminishing in colors uh, with the fading out of colors um, and uh, 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 when you ask uh, that if you if it is easy to find object in front of them they find it extremely difficult especially if there are more objects in front of them like uh, if you especially the people when they go to cooking and there are a lot of uh, spices in front of them they find it uh, challenging to find the correct uh, uh, spice uh, container uh, that is called simultaneous yeah there are a lot of things around they find it extremely difficult to locate the uh, uh, correct object and they have difficulty in face recognition as well which is called prosopagnosia now uh, uh, when towards the latter part of the disease when you are getting more and more uh, parietal lobe and the temporal lobe involvement they can get uh, syndromes like gerstmann syndrome where you get uh, difficulty in calculation difficulty in writing difficulty in recognizing uh, uh, fingers and then the left right disorientation or they can have uh, valent syndrome uh, which is ocular motor ataxia and optic ataxia and simultaneousia or they can have problems with reading which is called alexia or they can have problems with uh, the non dominant parietal lobe which is called apraxia where difficulty carrying out things uh, uh, like uh, 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 when you ask to sort of uh, calm, show how to demonstrate, like how to calm the patient, they find it difficult to demonstrate, although they don't have any motor dysfunction, uh, that their frontal lobe part is preserved with regard to the uh, motor functioning, but their parietal lobe make it difficult to perform the task. Uh, Posterior cortical atrophy, the pathologically, uh, uh, it is shown due to the Alzheimer's disease pathology where there is amyloids and then the tau proteins. Um, and in comparison to the typical Alzheimer's disease, they present relatively at a younger onset, less than 65. And they uh, have relatively preserved episodic memory, at least at the beginning. At the later on uh, disease, when the disease is progressed, they can involve the episodic memory. But the initial part of the disease, they have preserved episodic memory. And uh, in contrast to the frontotemporal dementias, the personality and the behavior aspect is not usually affected. Now, if you do imaging in the Alzheimer's disease, you may see that the posterior cortex is atrophied in these axial cuts. You don't see much atrophy in the posterior cortex in the axial cut, but if you do a uh, coronal section uh, of the image, you can see that the posterior parietal uh, and the occipital uh, lobes are really thinned out in the cortex, which is a, a very nice uh, view when you are appreciating posterior cortical atrophy. And if you have the facilities to do abnormal uh, uh, protein scans, like a tau PET scan, you can see that the posterior parietal and the cortex lobes are having a high uptake in the uh, tau ligand. Now, how we are going to manage the posterior cortical atrophy? Because we initially described that they are due to Alzheimer's pathology, acetylcholinesterase, like uh, gonopacil, rivastigmine, and memantine would be benefit, but not up to the same extent as a memory complaint person would benefit as. And the practical and the psycho psychological support to the patient and the caregivers are important. Especially, you need to address the safety for the uh, di driving. Um, um, if the patient is having significant visual spatial problems, you have to very politely discourage the driving for the safety of the patient and the others. And then the reading difficulty, if the patients enjoy a lot of reading and now it's difficult because of this uh, condition, audible books would be uh, coming handy. And uh, if the patient is having severe visual problems, then aids for the visually handicapped, like a white cane, or arranging uh, a very simple home environment, uh, do adjustments, uh, would be really, really useful in these patients. Let's go to the case three. Uh, this patient is a 60-year-old retired teacher brought in by the patient's daughter uh, due to uh, sort of annoying behavioral uh, problems with the patient. He has been seen by a psychiatrist and on treatment for depression. Um, this patient on direct questioning, uh, he has been less sympathetic to his wife 
according to the wife, uh, he's, she's extremely frustrated that he, she said that he's less sympathetic even since the marriage. But, uh, but uh, for the last few years, he has become extremely aggressive towards the wife and become abusive, even sort of uh, uh, scolding in abusive language. And uh, he has developed a new uh, hobby. He has preoccupied with taking care of pets now for the last couple of uh, years. Now, almost uh, more than a, a dozen of cats are at home. And he's, uh, he's repetitively feeding these cats. Almost every two hours early, patient is feeding the cats. And this has become a real nuisance for the family because the cats are everywhere. And then he used to feed the cats almost every two hours, saying that the cats are hungry. Uh, and uh, when you do a relative, uh, uh, when you do a minimal uh, score, his memory, the visual, spatial, and the language functions are relatively preserved. So it's more almost like no cognitive problems at all. Like, so what's wrong with this man who is present with behavioral problems? So this is a syndrome which we call behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, which is come under the umbrella term of frontotemporal dementia. In frontotemporal dementia, uh, you get uh, a dysfunction of the frontal and the temporal lobes. Uh, when you get uh, the behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, it's mostly the frontal lobe functions which been affected, but uh, 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 there's other uh, uh, category of frontotemporal dementia which is considered as primary progressive aphasia, where uh, you get the semantic dementia, where you get mostly the temporal lobe functions, commonly the left temporal lobe, but to a, to a lesser extent, the right temporal lobe also could be affected. And the other aspect which comes under primary progressive aphasia is a uh, progressive non-fluent aphasia, where you get uh, more motor part of the speech being affected and the grammatic speech is being lost. Um, uh, and then the logophenic aphasia, which is a variant of Alzheimer's disease pathology, which usually due to uh, a problem in the temporal and the parietal lobe, so the dominant aspect, the left side. We are not going to discuss the primary progressive aphasia today, but we'll discuss the behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia today. Now, behavioral frontotemporal dementia is the commonest FTD, and it presents uh, with a slowly progressive decline in the social and the emotional functions. Often, these cases are mistaken as for a midlife crisis, a crisis in the middle age, uh, or they may be treated for depression and other psychiatric disorders. But a primary psychiatric disorder to happen in the middle age is a little atypical. So you need to consider in those patients, could this be a behavioral frontotemporal dementia? These patients are mostly treated by the psychiatrist because the symptoms are more behavioral and, and then the families usually seek the psychiatric psychiatrist's help rather than a neurologist. Because of their, uh, these behavioral and the social problems, they may have recurrent job losses or marital uh, disharmony. Uh, or they may have separated from multiple spouses uh, could be seen of these behavioral problems. Uh, to diagnose behavioral uh, variant frontotemporal dementia, you need to have three out of six following criteria positive. And if, it, if they are there, then it will be a possible behavioral frontotemporal dementia. But then your diagnosis could be more strengthened by imaging and the histology if you have the facilities. So what are these six key criteria? They can have early behavioral disinhibition where yeah? a normal person would inhibit to perform a certain act because of the accepted social norms. These people are disinhibited. They may uh, behave uh, inappropriately for the strangers. So it will become a real nuisance for the family. They can have apathy, inertia, where they need a lot of encouragement and motivation even for their day-to-day -day activities like cleanliness. They might need a lot of pushing uh, uh, from behind to have a wash or have clean dresses. Uh, and they can uh, be having uh, demonstrate a loss of sympathy and empathy as we discussed in our case, uh, even a trivial, uh, even uh, uh, serious conditions of the family member, maybe diagnosing a cancer of the spouse, may be neglected or may be taken care of, not to be taken care of, uh, which is due to that loss of sympathy and empathy. They can have uh, preservativeness, uh, stereotype behaviors, the compulsive behaviors, the ritualistic behaviors can be demonstrated. So these people can be addicted to various things, maybe addicted to uh, shopping, gambling, or maybe develop uh, new hobbies like a person uh, has acquired, or uh, may be addicted to various kinds of things like phonography because of the behavioral things. 
they may develop uh, or have hyperorality uh, hand noted dietary changes they may develop a sweet tooth uh, towards the latter part of their uh, age uh, or they can demonstrate executive dysfunctions uh, where the person may be a sort of brilliantly functioning person now they might be even difficult to uh, plan for a holiday or sort of to plan uh, what is a shopping list kind of thing or uh, these kind of uh, functions could be affected. Now, executive dysfunction can be seen in the latter part of the Alzheimer's disease as well. So, how do you differentiate from the typical Alzheimer's disease from an executive dysfunction in the behavioral frontotemporal dementia? These people have relatively preserved motor and visual functions in their TDs. Now, there are about one fifth of cases could be associated genetically, and uh, there are commonly occurring genes like mapped granulin and C9 off, and then the common pathologies are the tower pathology, TDP43, and the FUS. Of course, we don't have the genetic and the pathological workup uh, uh, in our country, but we have the imaging facilities. If you do imaging, you can see atrophy of the frontal and the temporal lobe, uh, as you see in this scan. Now, the management is extremely challenging because there are no uh, disease-modifying therapies like in Alzheimer's disease, and uh, it's a sort of a supportive therapy. Overeating compulsivity uh, like problems could be benefited by SSRIs like citalopram and citalopram. The apathy uh, and inertia, these patients could be benefited by SNRI like venlafaxine. The social uh, this inhibition is an extremely embarrassing and challenging situation for the family members and the others. Uh, and you can educate the others and the society about his condition, which is one way of reducing the embarrassment. And if there are a lot of safety concerns like aggressiveness, uh, you might have to consider atypical antipsychotics, especially in the lower doses. Drugs like cutapine and risperidone are helpful. Care burden is an extremely important thing in these patients, and you need to address that as well. We are not going to discuss the primary progressive patients because of limited time, but we'll go for the case four. Uh, this is a 70-year-old woman present with, uh, presented uh, hospitalized for a hip fracture and developed a UTI and then the delirium. And patient was treated successfully and discharged home. And family reports that he, her visual hallucinations uh, are used to sort of continued. Uh, she claims that her children are always at her room, although they are not there. And she was treated with olanzapine for one of his visual for her visual hallucinations, and then developed prolonged drowsiness. She slept for almost two days after that. So they have to discontinue the treatment. And on examination, patient shows. Uh, bradykinesia and the family report symptoms suggestive of uh, REM sleep behavior disorder. So this comprises the syndrome of Levy body dementia, where you get uh, dementia with fluctuation of cognition. Sometimes the patients look very good, at sometimes extremely deteriorated, and sometimes comatose as well. And then uh, they can have visual hallucinations and REM sleep behavior disorders because this is a Sinucleinopathy, REM sleep behavior disorders are associated with the sinucleinopathies and commonly seen those problems. And the pathological hallmark is if you do a autopsy, a post uh, uh, autopsy brain studies, you can see the demonstrate the living bodies which are due to the uh, sinuclein proteins. Uh, there are a lot of supportive diagnoses, uh, which one of the important thing is that they are extremely sensitive to antipsychotics and they can have autonomic failure and they can have hypersomnia, excessive daytime sleepiness. Hyposmia, again, a feature of alpha synucleinopathy. They can have other hallucinations, non visual hallucinations as well, and then the delusions. Um, how do you are going to uh, manage the Levy body dementia? Uh, this uh, only symptomatic management is available. Uh, you should avoid antipsychotics. Her, their cognitive uh, symptoms are benefited by acetyl cholinesterase uh, inhibitors. Uh, the psychosis, you have to be very careful because uh, typical antipsychotics are extremely sensitive and they become drowsy. Uh, the primovanserine, trosopine, and cotepine are the appropriate treatment for their psychosis. If they have uh, REM sleep behavior disorders, melatonin and clonazepam are useful. Um, I'll try to end my talk here, uh, but the summary is like you need to understand it's a difficult area. You need to do a good history and a cognitive assessment. Uh, and that will be helpful uh, to differentiate various clinical syndromes. So take home message would be dementia syndromes are complex. Uh, good history and cognitive assessment the key to differentiate the conditions. Supportive, supportive diagnostic tools are helpful like brain imaging, biomarkers and histology, but in the resource poor uh, setting, unavailability is a challenge. 
and management of the patient and the care issues are also important uh, to consider uh, not only the patient thank you very much due to the restrictions in time we will not be able to take uh, questions directly but i would like to invite dr padmagnathna to make any concluding concluding remarks and also we'll keep the chat open so that you can you should be able to discuss with the resource persons and clarify your questions uh thank you uh, indika thank you very much for all three speakers dr gamni patrana dr champik munadana and dr manjula kaldera on addressing a uh, fairly common uh, neurological symptoms that we see in our common day to day practice uh, and it actually was a true companion of your health so i'm sure that they made it all those complex issues were made very simple and they would be answering your questions so the next 15 minutes in the chat thank you very much thank you so the resource persons will be stay in the chat room for a little while to answer your questions uh, with that we uh, bring this session to officially a closure and we'll be coming uh, uh, coming together for the next session there are two important sessions coming up one on injury prevention and other one on cardiology that's in the afternoon and the evening so stay tuned we are breaking for the lunch time for the time being i'll be back by one thank you